Good afternoon, everyone. It's a, a morning here in Ohio where I'm speaking from. And <clears throat> so I want to tell you some uh, work about matchings with uh, Andrew Holroyd and uh, James Martin. It appeared a couple of years ago in uh, the Annals Institute and Louis Poincaré. But uh, I want to emphasize the most interesting aspect, I think, is the approximation of high dimensional space or a random cloud a Poisson process in high dimensional space by a, the right kind of tree, which is a, named by a, Aldous and Steele as the Pui, the uh, Poisson weighted infinite tree. So before starting the talk proper, let me just uh, show you how this how this tree looks in kind of a picture. It's a bit hard to draw because it's a tree where every vertex has infinitely many children, but only finitely many of these turn out to be important, um, but the number of them that turn out to be important is itself random. Anyway, so how what does the quit look like? So this is a random tree that was defined by Aldous and Steele in order to study uh, limits of complete graphs, but we use it in order to study limits of Poisson process in high dimensions. So we start uh, at, the, at the root node, and it has, again, infinitely many children, and uh, there are weights or edge lengths that connect the, uh, the root to its children, and these are listed here, so L1, L2, and so on, and these are just the successive points of a standard Poisson process on the positive real line. In other words, these are the partial sums of standard exponential random variables. So this is L1, L2 ordered, and so on. So, so the vertex has infinitely many children. And here you see it in a more tree-like picture, where uh, here is the root. The first child has the lowest weight, lowest length. It's closest to the root. This is L1, L2, L3, and so on. So there are infinitely many children. And now the process continues. So for each of these children, they have infinitely many children. Um, and they have their own Poisson process, which determines the weights on the edges to these children. So for X1, we have L11, L12, and so on. And this continues in a, in a similar manner. So it is just like a... Um, labeled branching process, but every particle has, or every vertex has infinitely many children with these weights that form this uh, Poisson process. So, uh, so this will play the key role, and I wanted to kind of introduce it in a picture before starting the talk proper. And now um, let me change uh, to this official slides of the talk, which will describe how this Poisson weighted infinite tree is used uh, <clears throat> for understanding stable matchings, especially asymmetric stable matchings in D dimensions. So do you see my slide now, the, the PDF? Yes, That's yes, good. we can see it. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so, uh, <clears throat> so let me recall what's a stable matching, but um, really, in our case, it will be equivalent to a greedy matching. So in general, we have we have a set. It can be uh, can be finite or infinite, and the and the um, and we have a matching of the elements, and the matching can be in a colored case or a one color case. But we have a matching, and the matching is called unstable if we have if x prefers y to m of x and y prefers x to m of y. So to make sense of that, we have a preference order. So this was at the top here. Every node has a preference order on the other points, and we want a stable matching. So a stable matching means no unstable pair. An unstable pair is a pair that are not matched to each other and yet prefer each other to their official matches. So um, the origin of this uh, stable matching was in the work of uh, Gale and Shapley. And uh, they were 
the canonical example they considered was N men and N women. Each man has an ordering on the women, each woman has an ordering on the men. And again, we want a matching where there is no unstable pair. And uh, this was actually applied in the context of assigning residents to hospitals um, and eventually led to a Nobel Prize in economics, which by the time it was awarded, uh, Gail was no longer alive. So it was awarded to Shapley and Roth, who implemented this algorithm in many settings. Anyway, let me go closer to our topic. So here is a, a 1,000 red and 1,000 blue points uniformly distributed in a, in a torus. So think of the, these uh, boundaries, so um, periodic boundary conditions. So the left and right boundary is identified, the top and bottom are identified. We have 1,000 blue points, 1,000 red points. So what do we see here? Uh, the edges correspond to the matching. And this is the unique stable matching of these points. Uh, because the preference order here is by distance. So every red point prefers to be matched to the closest blue point. And in, or in general, it orders the blue points by distance and the blue points do the same. Because both sides are using the same metric to define the preference, the stable matching has a very simple construction in this case. So in general, Gale and Shapley described an algorithm to construct a stable matching. In general, the stable matching is not unique for general preference orders. But in this setting, when the matchings are determined by a single metric, the same both sides are using the same distance metric. Here it's just the Euclidean metric. Then uh, the stable matching is unique and can be constructed in a greedy fashion as follows. So consider all pairs of blue and red match the closest pair okay, and uh, remove it uh, from consideration and repeat. So just in a greedy way, take the closest pair and repeat. So this will work fine for a finite set. So if we have, uh, like in this picture and a finite set, we can construct the stable matching and you can easily prove inductively that in this in any stable matching this closest pair really have to be matched to each other any other assignment of them they will be unstable and then you can repeat inductively and see that this greedy construction will yield the unique stable matching now what is the analog of this greedy construction in the case of infinite sets so you can no longer so if you think of doing the same thing for infinite Poisson process in whole space. So you can't look at the closest blue and red pair because the infimum of distance is zero. But the analog of that is, is in parallel. So every blue point um, yeah, selects the closest red point and puts an arrow to it. So, uh, and similarly, every red point so selects the closest blue point. So each one selects the closest one of the other color. And if two points are selecting each other, then they get matched, okay? And, and this is kind of the first round. And after you do this, you remove all these matched pairs and repeat. So this kind of parallel greedy algorithm will work even with infinite sets and will construct the unique stable matching. So this is the unique stable matching for these, uh, uh, sorry. So this was the unique stable matching and I contrast it in the next picture. This is the same collection of points, but this is a different matching. It's the minimal length matching of the same points. So you see that on average, the distances here are shorter. Um, again, this because this is defined to be the one that minimizes the total length. In the minimal, length matching, it's easy to see that there can be no crossing edges, for instance, if we're doing it um, in, in Euclidean space, particular in two dimensions, while in two dimensions, if we look at the one before the stable matching, it actually does have edges that cross each other because it's constructed in this uh, greedy uh, fashion. There is no obstruction, nothing prevents edges from crossing. 
and you have some very long edges from un for unlucky vertices that somehow everyone around them got matched before they did. Okay, um, so mm, so there is the Gale Shapley algorithm which it works in arbitrary preference is very um, nice, but due to time, I won't uh, go through it because in our case, we don't need the general Gale Shapley algorithm. So, because we're working, as I said, with symmetric preference functions and, uh, and that have these properties. So, uh, there is no, because we're putting points down in the Poisson process, there are no pairs where the where there are ties between the distances. And it also has the property, obvious property, that for every um, fixed x, the number of points at finite distance from x is itself finite. And another property of Poisson process is no descending chains. So if you look at um, <laughs> a, points of the Poisson process, it's a nice classical exercise that there is no sequence of points x0, x1, x2, and so on, which where the distance, so this, this is the distance from x0 to x1, the distance from x1 to x2, and so on, where these distances are descending. If, if, the, if we have some other length function which has a dis descending chains, then uh, the algorithm I described to you, the greedy algorithm, uh, wouldn't wouldn't be well defined, but uh, or rather it wouldn't match every point. But once you have uh, no such infinite chains, then it's easy to show just with these abstract conditions. So we don't need more from the Poisson process. Just these abstract conditions, which are easy to verify for Poisson process imply that there is a unique stable matching and it can be constructed by this parallel uh, greedy algorithm that I described to you before. Now, we are mostly interested today in the bipartite stable matching where we have two colors and try to match each color to the other one, but it's also useful to look at the easier setting of matching of one color. So in the one color matching, all points are, you know, are accepted to be matched with all other points. And this, in the general theory of matchings, this is actually more problematic. Sometimes there is no stable matching, but in the geometric theory where we use the distance function to match, this is an easier case. Um, so this is a picture of the stable matching of 2000 points. And, and again, I'm, in repeating that the unique stable matching can be constructed by recursive nearest neighbor matching, which I described to you before. Um, and that implies that if we want to know whether a specific vertex X is matched somewhere within distance R, it suffice. So we cannot determine this just by looking at the ball of radius R around X because some points near the boundary of the ball might be matched outside the ball. However, it suffices to know information about all descending paths with uh, where the weights are less than R. That will tell us you know, all descending paths that start in this ball and have weights less than R, that will tell us uh, where X, whether X is matched to a ball to something inside the ball of radius R, and the weight of an edge is just the, the distance along the edge. Um, one of Odej Ram's last papers with uh, Holroyd, Pimantel, and myself was uh, looking at the problem of understanding the asymptotics of this uh, matching, and, um, and I'll just mention some of the results there. Uh, and uh, so, for instance, if you um, look at the setting, you have a Poisson process in RD, usual Euclidean distance, then the stable matching is a perfect matching, all points get matched. And if we look at the distribution of X minus the distance from X to the match point um, for a typical point, so 
to formalize this, you consider the palm version of the process. So you add the point at the origin and look and look at this palm version and ask what is the distance from the point in the origin to the matched point. But equivalently, if we want to understand the distance from X to its match in a typical point, just look at the large box and do the statistics. How many of the points in the large box get matched further than some distance R? Take the limit in the as the box grows. This fraction will give you this distribution. So we're interested in distribution from a typical point to the matched one, which can be formalized by doing averaging or by looking at the palm version of the process where we add a point to the origin. In any case, this distance, it turns out in D dimensions, it has the dth moment is infinite. And that is sharp because uh, the tails are bounded by uh, R to the minus D. So, so it means for this uh, stable one color matching, one type matching, we have very good understanding of the distance. And this is uh, one of the easiest results in the paper. So uh, this is an easy fact. Uh, the bipartite case is harder. So one challenge, it's not the challenge from this current paper I'm reporting on, but it's one of my favorite point problems that uh, every few weeks I come back to think, well, do I have some idea on this problem, which is the bipartite Poisson matching problem to understand the tails. So, um, so the interesting case here is, again, we have um, blue and red points with the same intensity. So if they have different intensities, it's an easy problem. If there are more blues and reds and we have bipartite matching, then all the reds will be matched. They will be matched with exponential tails. But uh, the interesting case here is when uh, the density is the same. So half, so P, if we think of P as, of course, we could generate this by starting with a Poisson process uh, and coloring every point independently with pro red with probability P and blue with probability one minus P. And the interesting case here is P equals a half where, so we have the same intensity of blue and red points. The stable matching is perfect, but we don't know the tail of the distance. So if X is the distance from a point to its match for a typical X, and again, you can formally think of it by adding to the Poisson process one point to the origin and coloring it say red, doesn't matter. And then looking in this configuration, what is the distance from this point at the origin to its match? And in, in one dimension, we understand this, that uh, the critical moment is the half moment. And uh, so that moment is, is infinity, but any moment less than a half is finite. And even the one dimensional case here is not trivial. Uh, so um, that's surprising, but it's still not hard. Uh, for already for two dimensions, we don't know what is the what are the tails of the matching distance. And I'll tell you that you know I was first working on this with the uh, Holroyd and Pimentel, and we couldn't even show any power law tail for X until Odet joined us, and then uh, he had some new ideas which allowed proving a, a power law tail. But the powers are not sharp. And in fact, the powers we get get slightly worse as the dimension grows. And, um, and so for, for dimension two, we get a power uh, which is, which is uh, one half where, where we expect, which is, sorry, which is worse than one half, while we expect the power to be better than one half, better than in one dimension. So, so there are interesting questions about the tails, but the question whether the matching is perfect, that actually is easy. So there is an easy ergodic theory argument, soft argument that so shows that the, there can be no, or really elementary, there can be no points left over. So now we switch to the star of today's talk where we will use the quit and that's the two type asymmetric stable matching. So, uh, so the setting here is we have a Poisson process of rate one in our D. 
Each point is colored red with probability epsilon and blue with probability one minus epsilon, but the matching rules are asymmetric. So blue, blue and blue red matches are permitted, but red red are forbidden. So the red points cannot be matched. A red point cannot be matched with another red point, but all other pairs are allowed. And so the preference order is for a red point, it prefers the blue points in order of distance. So it prefers the closest blue point than the next one. A blue point is colorblind. It prefers the other points in order of their distance without worrying about their color. So it is, a, so this is the asymmetry. So, okay, so epsilon is the fraction of reds. It's, and again, reds are the more picky. They only get matched with blues. So if the fraction of red is bigger than a half, it's trivial that the stable matching is not perfect uh, because there are not enough blue points to match all the reds. Now, the same, you can easily see the same must be true for some fractions less than a half because uh, there's a positive fraction of mutually closest blue-blue pairs. So if you have a blue-blue pair which are closer to each other than to all other points, they will be matched and they will be taken out of the game. There's a positive fraction of that. And after that, still the remaining blues have to be matched to the reds. And if, since the reds only agree to be matched to blues and there are fewer blues, this is easy to see that in this case, the, the fraction of, uh, so you can get an epsilon slightly less than half where uh, the matching is not perfect. Here is the open question, which, which we cannot solve, but we can solve in some asymptotic sense. So is it true, fix the dimension D, is it true that for all epsilon, no matter how small, uh, there will be remaining uh, unmatched red points? So again, we start with a tiny fraction of reds. Epsilon, so think of epsilon as very small. And then we apply this asymmetric matching. Will there always be leftover red points? Or uh, if epsilon, or the other alternative is that if epsilon is small enough, then the matching will be uh, perfect. So again, all the blue points certainly get matched because if there are leftover blue points, they just start getting match, matching to each other. So there will be no leftover blue points. But the question is, are there leftover red points? And this is open. Now, what we prove, okay, I'll show, tell you what we prove in a moment. Here is a picture of this uh, thing. So what is the, uh, the green point? There are no initially green points. The green is just a device to show you the red points that get, that are left unmatched in the end. So in this case, I forget what is the fraction of red we started with, but it's something less than half. Um, again, we apply this asymmetric matching. And uh, so all the blues get matched. That's true in any density. Some reds are left over unmatched and then we color them green so we can see them. So this is the, the result. Um, and here is our theorem. So this is what we can prove. Fix epsilon and consider the asymmetric matching that I described to you. Each point is red probability epsilon, blue with probability one minus epsilon in the Poisson process. Um, then if D is sufficiently large and sufficiently large here depends on epsilon, then there are unmatched red points. Okay, so we can analyze this model for fixed epsilon with D tending to infinity. And, but, but D is a constant. So uh, if the dimension, look at the bottom here, if the dimension is large enough, which is about E to the one over epsilon, then we can show that there are uh, unmatched red points. So, the, so it's an interchange of limits question. We can do it for every epsilon, we can show for large D. But if you play the game the other way and fix D and let epsilon tend to zero, then for epsilon very small, we can't answer uh, whether there will be unmatched red points. So how do we prove such a theorem? That's where the quit comes in. So I'll skip the multi-type case. And just uh, 
remind you the PWIT I described in the beginning. Um, so I think the picture was uh, better than this slide. So remember, every vertex has infinitely many children with weights which are um, Poisson. And <laughs> the PWIT was defined by Aldous and Steele to understand limits of labeled complete graphs. And I won't go into their theory, uh, but I'll describe how um, we use the same tree when, and the key is to understand how does this cloud of points, the Poisson process look in terms of local geometry and high dimension. So again, for the rigorous proof, you'll have to look to the paper. I don't have time, but I want to describe the intuition. So consider a Poisson process of rate one in D dimension seen from a typical point. So um, again, and formally think of this typical point located at the origin. So, so write the other points of the process, x1, x2, x3, in order of their distance from the origin. <clears throat> then if you look at the volume, uh, so between the origin and x1, right? Uh, look, draw the sphere around the origin of radius x1. So, so that sphere is empty. And its volume exactly has a distribution, which is a standard exponential variable. So in general, if you uh, look at the points of the Poisson process in D dimensions labeled according to their distance from the origin, but now for each one, you look at the volume of the ball around the origin with that radius. This sequence of volumes will just be a standard Poisson process on the positive real line. And from this, we can easily deduce that in high dimensions, the radius of X1 is very concentrated. It's in, in, close to the one over the dth root of the volume of the d-dimensional unit ball, omega d. Um, now, that's the geometry as the origin looks out. So it has this uh, Poisson process of volumes when it looks at the volumes of the balls to the other points. Now let's take the point x1 and look at what are the points closest to it. So besides the origin, the others, so the origin we already took care of. So let's look at the others, x1, 1, x1, 2, and so on in order from distance to x1. So their distances from x1 converge to a Poisson process. So now it's no longer true that it's exactly a Poisson process because we have some information on x1 that the ball you know, in the direct that there are no other points in the direction of the origin, but as D grows, this information becomes unimportant, and and uh, the the distances from X one converge to a Poisson process. So the other thing is when we look at the distance, the vector to X one from the origin, and the vector from X one to its other closest point, X one one, these vectors. Uh, we expect, and it's easy to prove, in high dimensions, these become asymptotically orthogonal. So when we go to x1 and then to the closest point, we go in, in an orthogonal direction. So the distance to x11 is approximately square root 2 times the distance from the origin to x1. So x11 is not among the first million points closest to the origin, because those are all concentrated near omega d to the minus one over d. So the geometric picture here really converges to the width. And this is a formal statement of that fact that as weighted graphs, if we look at the palm version of the Poisson process, look at the uh, distances that arise and look at the descending paths that arise, they converge to the same picture in the width. And um, so to analyze stable matching in D dimensions for D large, we can analyze stable matching on the quit, and that can be done in, so I, so sorry, I'm running out of time. Can I have five more minutes? Is that okay? Yes, yeah, so of course. It's a uh, last two. We have plenty yeah, of time. So, so um, yeah, I was ambitious and said that half an hour will be enough, but I didn't uh, actually meet it. But I, But we're close to the end of what I want to tell. So... We just have a couple couple more slides. You left. have enough time. Take as much as you need. Okay. So, 
So I want to describe um, how we can analyze the stable matching on the quit. And the easier thing is first to look, let's look at the problem, which is um, easy, the one type stable matching to understand the idea of how we reduce stable matching on the quit to a simple differential equation. And then for the two type asymmetric, it's a less simple differential equation, but still analyzable. So let's go back to one type matching, but now on the quit. So again, remember the picture of the quit that I showed you in the beginning, and, uh, and we are matching the vertices of the quit. And so, so the vertices of the quit are replacing now the Poisson points, but we're looking at one color matching. So no colors, just to make the analysis simple. Um, okay, and uh, we're match, we are doing the stable matching, which is the same as the greedy matching for the vertices of the quit. Now, let X of T be the probability that the root is not matched along any edge with weight or length less than T. So this is a function we want to understand. So um, now, uh, what's, uh, what does it mean that, um, so maybe I should, I, I should add one more definition, which I skipped from the previous page. So again, we're considering the stable matching on the quit. And if J is a child of the root um, and say the, the weight there is TJ, we say that J is available to the root if J is not matched in its subtree with weight less than TJ. So um, you see, if we can try to match this child in its own subtree, and if it's matched successfully with weight less than TJ, then it's not interested in matching to the root. But if when we match it inside its subtree, the edge it, um, <coughs> the edge that it is matched along has length bigger than TJ, then this vertex will be interested to match to its parent, namely to the root. But the question is, will the root want to match to it? But at least then in this case, we say that the child is available. So if, so again, J is available, if J is not matched along an edge with weight less than TJ in this, its own subtree. Okay, then in the stable matching, what happens the root is matched to the first of its children, which is available. So the root will look along the edges, first to x1, to the closest child. If x1 is available, the root prefers to match to it. But if x1 is unavailable, x1 is happier inside its subtree, then the root looks to x2 and so on, x3, x4, and so on. And it will be matched to the first one uh, where uh, the first one of its children, which is available. Okay, so keeping that in mind, um, so the process of avail so if we look at the process of available children of the root, actually the process of the distances from the root to its available children. So this, uh, this is an inhomogeneous Poisson process with rate function x of t, because we are basically thinning the all the children of the root, they form a standard Poisson process on the positive line. And we're thinning this process where the probability to retain uh, a point in the process is just X of T if it's the distance is T from the origin. So if you have a Poisson process on the positive line and you thin it, so you just retain uh, particles with probabilities that depend on their location, you get the inhomogeneous Poisson process, very standard thing. And the root is matched to the first point of this inhomogeneous Poisson process. So this gives us an identity for X of T. So X of T is the chance that uh, the root is not matched anywhere within distance T. So that means that there, the process of available children, which is this inhomogeneous Poisson process, has no points in this interval zero T. Now for an inhomogeneous Poisson process, we have a formula for what is the probability that it assigns zero mass to some 
set to some interval. It is just the integral of the intensity over that interval exponentiated. More, so, you, so it's e to the minus the, right? So you look at the expected number of, for an inhomogeneous Poisson process, if we have a set, in this case, the interval zero t, the expected number of points in this set is the integral of the intensity. And to find the probability that the set has no points, we just do e to the minus this lambda, e to the minus this integrated intensity. But the definition of the process says that this, that the event that this is empty, there are no available points within this T is exactly the event that the origin is not mapped. So we get an identity for this function X of T. It's E to the minus its integral. And well, this is one of the uh, simplest integral equations you can imagine. You just differentiate it. And uh, since we know how to differentiate an exponential, we get X prime is minus X squared. And we also know that X of zero is one because uh, you know, the root is not matched within distance zero. So this initial condition together with this differential equation um, you know, has a simple unique solution, which is one over T plus one. So this tells us all the information we need, namely that the probability the origin is unmatched. First of all, it goes to zero. So, so the fact you see with this, uh, even if we didn't know in advance, in this case, that the matching is perfect, this proves that the matching is perfect because x of t will go to zero as t goes to infinity. And, um, but it also tells us the rate, and the rate is one over, uh, one over t. Now remember that t here corresponds to a radius to the d. So this corresponds, if we go back to Euclidean space, this corresponds to the uh, power law D decay that we already know for this one type matching. So, so the result does agree with the result we have proved. Okay, so now that we understand the logic, um, I, I can go to the last slide, which describes the analog of this for the asymmetric two type matching. So in this case, um, we have two functions. R of t is the probability that the root is red, but not matched along an edge of weight less than t. And B of t is the probability that the root is blue and not matched along an edge of weight less than t. So the processes of available red and blue children of the root um, are in themselves in homogeneous Poisson processes of rates R of T and B of T on, on R. And then a similar logic to before gives us equations for these uh, functions R of T so, and B of T. So for instance, R of T, the probability that the root is not matched within distance T is, um, <laughs> so, and, and is red, right? So R of T corresponds to the, root being red and not matched within distance t. So the root being red gives us probability epsilon and, and then we want it not to be matched within distance t, which means that the process of uh, blue available points will have no, no points there. And here we get to exponentiate this, uh, exponentiate this integral in the same logic as before. Now for B of T, the equation is a little more complicated because we have to multiply a one minus epsilon, which is the probability the root is blue. We have to multiply it by the exponential of the integrated intensity, but the relevant integrated intensity here is the sum of the intensities of red and blue points. So, uh, it's possible because the blue point at the origin could be matched to either red or blue points. So, so we have these two functions and now we can take these two integral equations, get differential equations from them. And now we have a pair of coupled differential equations and we also know the boundary conditions. So B of zero is one minus epsilon, just the probability that the origin is blue. And R of zero is epsilon, the probability that the root is red. And, okay, so 
I don't have time. In a longer talk, I would, uh, in the different audience, maybe go through the solution of this pair of equations. These can be, this couple can be solved. And what we find is that B of t goes to zero as t goes to infinity, as we expect. But R of t goes to some positive constant, uh, not to zero. So this means, and that's true for any epsilon. So this means that with positive probability, the root is red and unmatched. So this is true in the quit. And then since we have an approximation of the Euclidean space by the quit, uh, we can deduce that this is true also in Euclidean space if the dimension is high enough. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I have. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Do we have, uh, we, we upload here, but it's not very heard. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Uh, are there questions? You will, how again are you using the fact that you need a large high dimension? Well, we're using it because um, I told you that the uh, process is approximated, the process of the geometry, geo local geometry of the Poisson process is approximated by the quit. But it's definitely, you know, this approximation is only true as d goes to infinity. At any finite d, uh, the distances uh, don't look like the quit. So, for instance, if we look at the first point x1, uh, the fact that the ball around the origin is empty kind of really affects the distances from x1 to the next point. But in high dimensions, this, uh, this effect is negligible. So if I look at X1 and look at balls around it, the fraction of that ball that's occupied by the ball around the origin is, is tiny in high dimensions. So the fact that the ball around the origin is empty becomes unimportant in high dimensions. But in, you know, in two dimensions, in three, in five dimensions, it's still important. So the whole... You know, and and the tree structure doesn't hold. So if if I work in a, in a fixed finite dimension, it's possible that the closest point to x one that's not the origin will be, say, the second closest point to the origin. That's very in two dimensions. This is quite likely, but in high dimensions, it's easy to show that it it just doesn't happen. So as d goes to infinity, the probability of such an event goes to zero exponentially in dimension. So um, there is the, so that's where we're using the fact that we can approximate effectively the matching problem in, in Euclidean space with the pro same problem in the quit. And then in the quit, we have this recursive structure and those who have seen say Aldous's uh, first solution of the um, assignment problem it is actually based on a similar idea back in 2000. So, um, so this is a kind of a rigorous cavity method, which is uh, you know which is used here to understand the quit. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. In in this uh, last equation that you said that you would speak uh, how to get it if if you would have more time. Yeah. Uh, is it the unique solution, what you, what you say here, that B goes to zero, R to constant? So, B, so, so these, these two, yeah, this pair of coupled equations together with these boundary conditions have a unique solution. And yeah, although we can't, when we I said we can solve it, we can't uh, solve exactly right B of T and R of T as a function of, uh, of T, but we can write B and R as functions of each other, and that's enough to conclude uh, this, uh, to make these conclusions. Again, the fact that B of t goes to zero is elementary. You don't need the differential mm -hmm. equation for that. But the fact that R of t goes to a non-zero constant, that is you know, not, not so immediate. Um, in that uh, first uh, open question, or in all these questions, uh, in, uh, in this setting, do you always uh, assume that the what will be the tail um, expansion or you also expect they will be polynomial? The Sorry. tail of the distances. 
the tail of the distances. So mm -hmm. you're talking about in the symmetric case, the open problem there. So yes, so yes. There we know it's a, we know it's a polynomial because mm -hmm. there are it upper is long, upper. long range uh, system, long what? range dependence systems or not? Yeah, there is some long range dependence, but uh, so it's, okay. a, it's, it's, it's a critical system. There's long range dependence and there's a power law, but we don't know what is the power. That's the challenge. Mm -hmm. So, so it can be if you want to get a parameter, make the. So I described if you think of the fraction of so fraction of red, you do symmetric matching, but um, the fraction of reds you think of it as a parameter. Then there is a subcritical phase, a critical phase where which is the fraction half and the supercritical. And the, and as usual in kind of physical systems, the subcritical and supercritical case are easier and have exponential decay, while the critical case has power law decay. So all these things we know. So in, so in the supercritical case, when you have, say, more reds than blues, then all reds, um, uh, then all blues get matched, and some reds get left over. But the reds that do get matched also have exponential tail in how far they get. They have to go. So the supercritical, subcritical case have exponential tails. The, the critical case, we know it has power law tails. We have upper and lower bounds, but uh, we don't know what are the power and what is worse is we don't understand even the, you know, the behavior in, in two dimensions. So only one dimension is understood there. Mm -hmm. Thank you.